I'd like to now introduce my guest of the evening, Ashok. Uh, Ashok has a career that has spam, spanned, you know, business and public health del delivery. He was a part of a very small team that joined, you know, that came from McKinsey's New York office to set up McKinsey in India. In 2003, he left uh, McKinsey to uh, head the Gates Foundation with the pioneer Avahan HIV prevention program. Uh, Avahan used business thinking to achieve scale and swiftly became the world's largest HIV prevention initiative, private um, HIV prevention initiative, operating in six states with a collective population of exceeding 300 million. In 2014, Ashok set up the Antara Foundation to extend methods of scaling to maternal and child health. Today, the Antara Foundation's innovations have been rolled out to 46,000 villages in Rajasthan, and currently, TAP operates in nine districts of Madhya Pradesh, addressing over 12% of India's under five deaths. Ashok has been a senior fellow at Harvard School of Public Health and has served on boards of numerous social sector enterprises. He has several passions outside of work, ranging from chess, where he's nationally ranked to, po to pa portrait painting in oils. His acclaimed books, A Stranger Truth and How the Light Gets In, offer profound insights into this journey. I do also want to mention that the entire proceeds of his latest book, a Strain, uh, How the Light Gets In, which I've read, and it's a beautiful, beautiful book, and I'd recommend all of you go out and buy it right away, uh, will go to the Tribal Children's Cache Fund. Uh, and really, the message of the book is uh, uh, being on the power of the poorest women and their ability to solve their own problems. So with that, Ashok, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you, Anu. It's always a delight to work with you. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I can't see the audience, but uh, I, I know the typical ILSS audience is really great to work with and be with. So thank you. Thank you, Ashok. And I must say that the first time I heard Ashok speak, which was, I think, in 2018, and he was talking about the work that the Antra Foundation was doing, but also the work he had done, uh, uh, you know, working with commercial sex workers at, in the Avahan project. Uh, at the end of the pro, uh, session, when I went to thank him, I burst out into tears because I was so deeply moved. And I must tell you, parts of your book made me cry as well. Uh, but let's get back to your journey. Ashok, yours has been a fascinating journey. And I'd like just for the audience to understand, uh, you know, your work with Abahan, you know, what made you take up that challenge and what, you know, you, what were some of your learnings from Abahan? What was, what we, what seeded the idea of the Antara Foundation? Just a little bit of that journey for us uh, would be really lo lovely for the audience to understand. Yeah. You know, the, I, I know at the time when I uh, left McKinsey to uh, start this program called Abahan, I had been become a senior partner at McKinsey. Now, anyone who knows McKinsey knows that uh, it's a severe upper out place. And when you reach that level, it's like um, getting tenure in a good university. That's not the time when you think of leaving. But I, I think there's, there's two things that are at work. You can always talk about the proverbial offer you can't refuse, but I, I think about it differently. There is, I believe there's a restlessness that comes to many people at some stage in their life. You could be 21 and you could be 65, but at some stage, there's a feeling that was going inside me, which was to say, look, there's something else out there which, which is, needs to you need to get involved with. And it's then that I think you start, uh, it's not a happy feeling, it's an inconvenient feeling because you're doing something you, which is more of a comfort zone. Uh, but then this offer came, you start hearing things and you start hearing, seeing, meeting people suddenly when your mind is like that, to create a program to stem the growth of HIV in India. And it took me, I said, I thought I'd won the jackpot. You know, it's just, I just jumped straight into it, not knowing what I was letting myself in for, by the way. Yeah. That's how it so, happened. So, Ashok, talking about the Abahan project, and you do talk very beautifully in your book uh, about it. Uh, what were your learnings from that project? I mean, what did you learn about your work with the commercial sex workers? What were some of the key things that you took away from that from that journey? 
Yeah, I've talked about my entire first book, A Stranger Truth. Uh, it's like this uh, title suggests. It was being catapulted into another India. So you remember, I'm coming in as a McKinsey person. I can't see the audience, but some people must be smiling here. Because McKinsey people have paid a lot of money to solve other people's problems. In other words, there has got to be a little bit of arrogance if you're doing that kind of job, uh, which actually masks a lot of insecurity, but that's another story. Uh, so even as I took this, this kind of offer and jumped in, I'm embarrassed to say it now, but I had about two solutions in mind. I said, this is a supply chain solution. This is a communications issue, talking to sex workers. First. But my book then starts with a first line which says, don't step on the people having sex. And so that started a first day when I was suddenly introduced into the many, many women, types of women, almost some who are like children, some who are like old women. I met people having sex in a field. That's the first line. And I ended up with a group of sex workers in a room, and by which time I was quite staggered. And I didn't know what to say. I said, you have to use condoms before we, before you, you have sex. And the, she said, I have to thank her. She set me on a course. She said, sir, don't you think we know about condoms? We are sex workers. And she said, why don't you ask us why we don't use condoms? And this set off a light bulb, which is how I took up on the journey. But I've learned three things by summarize them. The first is that there is another India. I mean, after sex work, I'm working in the India of where the, of the poorest mothers and their children. So that's the second. There is another India, which I at least didn't know existed. Uh, second is a journey into a world of public health itself and to see how much is broken. But the third, and I think the most important journey for me, and perhaps some of the audience may want to know about that, is a journey inside. And the series of crossovers it entailed for me which meant uh, a change in who I was and my attitudes uh, over the course of this work. So that's, it's a bit like that. So Ashok, the idea of the Antara Foundation, you carried it in your heart for a while before you even, you know, once you, you know, wrapped up with the Avahan project, what, when did that idea come to you? How did it germinate? See, I started work on Avahan in 2003, and Antra started in 2013, 14, or 10 years later. What is singular about the Avahan program was it demonstrated how you build scale, how you achieve rapid scale up. Because in the NGO sector, or certainly in public health, there's excellent work being done by many people, but it's not scalable. So we, and Avahan grew very rapidly. I mean, those figures show it. In leaps and bounds, by year three or four, we were at complete scale in six states. So without getting into how you did that, there were some principles there, which I said to myself, this is not rocket science, what we're doing. In a way, it's oddly like business itself. You're using many business principles to it, looking at demand, looking at supply, looking at community, using data like crazy. It could be business. So I said to myself then, and this was 2004, five, two years after getting started, that there's room to create an organization that does this. And so here I'm captivated by Avahan, and it's still work to be done. And I'm getting very excited by something else that could be done. So naturally, I kept that thought working in my head for 10 years then. And I met a lot of people in the book. It shows how I met people as diverse as Mukesh Ambani to various other people to see what they thought of this idea. I don't think anyone understood what I was really saying, but the idea was to create an organization that can work at scale, working through women at the very bottom of the pyramid. I was working with mothers and small children. And in my second book, in the introduction, I make a statement which is not meant to offend anyone, but it's a fact that if you see the position of a mother in many far-flung villages of the north, see the position of a sex worker in a place in Bombay or anywhere else, it's a tough choice to make which one is worse off. 
So that's the work we do nowadays. So absolutely. And Ashok, you know that I consider you one of India's foremost feminists for thinking about nobody is really thinking about this. And what came through for me so beautifully in the book was despite your success with the Avahan, despite the platform you had, uh, just the, and I don't want to play any spoilers here, go read the book, guys, but I'm just saying it was tough. You met people, you, you know, you sought funding, you did have, you know, support some, from some incredible people, but it was still tough going, convincing uh, people to fund. Uh, what, in fact, my question, it's not even a question, it's a comment that what will it take for the society to celebrate the leaders that are really working for the most marginalized and vulnerable people? Why are we not celebrating them enough? It's almost, I'm not even asking for an answer, but you know, this was just like, when I was reading the book, I kept saying, this is so important. And why is it that Ashok still, I mean, tell me about the story of Antara Ashok, you know, how was, how has the journey been? Even if you can, I know that you, in the book, it's sort of, you've divided it into three or four sort of periods, but if you could just briefly share the journey of Antara to today. Well, I had this notion of working in maternal and child health. And you can say why. I think it's actually it is India's largest public social calamity. If you look at the data, India ranks among some of the uh, countries which are very badly off. Our neighbors, for example, India's uh, outcomes in, in mother and child health. I'm talking about things like malnutrition, infant mortality, maternal mortality are extremely poor. So the idea of maternal and child health, I knew. I have traveled enough to know that there is a, a similar set of circumstances that you saw with sex workers. Women who had no agency. By agency, I mean they had no control over their lives. Usually some powerful man had that control, just as with sex workers. So this idea was percolating. But usually I found there's some, some striking incident that, that just spins your head around and says, okay, uh, this is the way. With me, it was that first day where the sex worker asked me that question. She was very polite, but it really shocked me that, that I didn't know the answer to that question. This, this book starts with a story I've related in the opening first page of the book. Uh, without giving away the book, I'll say it's a story of a young mother. She might have been 18 to 20 years old. Uh, in a very remote village, we stumbled upon her, never saw her face the whole part, but she wore a white threadbare sari, which had, you could see the remnants of roses on the border. And I wondered where had she come from that she has roses on a white sari, but today she's where she is. And I saw a baby looking out and I felt, I imagined she was looking at me uh, and the baby was dying. Um, because of severe malnutrition. Now, severe malnutrition can be treated very easily by there's a particular protocol. Government has these centers just a few miles away. She couldn't do anything about it because her father-in-law would not allow it. And there the story begins. Someone told me, if you write a book with this as your opening chapter, people will never read the book. But I think, well, I don't, you don't really write thinking in that way. I like to think the book is hilarious in parts. I think it's, hopefully it's inspiring, exciting, but there's also tragedy. Outer with the goats was very, <laughs> I was chuckling in the middle of some teary, you know, some tears. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I had to say that. No, it started there. And then this time around, unlike Avahan, I had a template and say, okay, we did this in Avahan, can it work here? So in Avahan, what happened is that a, the HIV program, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, tens of thousands of women started joining the program, not because they were trying to join an HIV prevention program. They were not interested. HIV prevention was not sort of on top of their uh, mind, but they were interested in something that would provide protection for their children. So they wanted a program that could deal with violence. And it's very strange. They, they came up with these solutions themselves. Now in the case, this is how two different sets of women, 
mothers and sex workers are exactly the same. What they both want is the safety of their children. And that is what they both don't have the agency to do. So thinking like that, I said, I had learned another principle. There's a logic in it. The people who know the reason why there is suffering in their lives are the women who live with that problem every day. It's logical, right? They perfectly well know why they're so badly off. If they know what the problem is and the root causes, they will also have the right solutions. All you have to do is drop your pretense of being a smart guy from McKinsey or someplace who knows has two answers to everything and just say those words, which are, I don't know how to deal with this. Can you explain this to me? And then the things open up. For me, this is part of the transformation. So the same thing is happening now in rural India where we work. I mean, we have gatherings, not self-help groups, by the way, which are very different. We have organic gatherings of women coming together, taking on huge challenges, huge challenges by working as a community. So this is this is really how it all started. And in the process, the internal uh, change was happening inside me, some very striking changes. I'm not trying to pretend that I'm a, you know, a great guy or anything, but I'm just pointing out a fact that I must have been a very shallow guy, perhaps, but some striking changes happened inside me. I also feel that anyone who, uh, all of this is in the nature of an adventure, but anyone who's been on an adventure of any kind knows there's no coming back from that. Roads lead on to roads and all that sort of stuff. So that's where, that's where I am. Uh, doing it it's uh... no absolutely uh, and i really wish i could double click on really the internal transformation that you've gone through but i do want to also just in in you know for the audience to understand because a lot of the audience today are people who want to be in the sector uh don't know you know how to begin how you know what to do uh you know when you were setting up uh, your teams at avahan and antra foundation you weren't always looking for public health professionals. Uh, so what were you prioritizing as your qualities for your initial teams uh, that you felt would, you know, would con contribute to the success? What were those qualities that were like sort of non-negotiable? Skills can be taught, but what were some of the mindsets and attributes that you were looking for? I was certainly not looking for public health experience. I was not looking for people who had a master's in public health or a PhD. Nothing wrong with all of that, but very often it's stuff that can also get in the way. First and foremost, I was looking with people who had passion, an overriding passion to do this, something that makes a big difference beyond what they're already having success at. Now, how do you judge that? That's another story. It's tough to judge that. But an overriding passion, a feeling that nothing can stop this if I do it. The second is that I wanted classic business skills. I wanted people who could think in the rudimentary ABCs of strategy, who could do simple analytics, who are comfortable with data, but who could speak to many different kinds of people, th those kinds of things, but also had certain characteristics that don't happen if you're successful in business. You were, unlike me when I started, you couldn't be arrogant. You had to be very humble. Uh, you had to stop intellectualizing things. Uh, you had to ask the way. Uh, over time, you should be the kind of person who develops, you can't come in with that necessarily, but you develop such a strong conviction that what you're doing cannot ever be stopped, no matter what. And then you can continue. Now, can you judge all of this early? Actually, you can judge quite a lot. Uh, now, the way you can judge is this. If you, it's about the restlessness. I hope I'm not sounding too, too zen here, but uh, there is a restlessness that if it grips somebody and you don't push it away, you can open many doors and it comes across uh, when you talk to them. If you ask them, why do you really want to do this? Here's a test. Many of us have choices. Many of us, I used to say, what if I did this? So I go and talk to people. You've done this. What's it like? What's it like? 
that actually leaves you only more confused because each person starts telling you their own experience. Is that my experience? What if the other question came to is, what if you don't do this? A simple question, what if you don't do this? Will you spend the rest of your life thinking what would it have been like? If that is the question, don't think twice, just do it. Uh, otherwise, you will spend the rest of your life wondering. That's what I No, absolutely. And I, I love what you said, this restlessness, this stop over intellectualizing. You know, there is a uh, there is a conviction that eventually comes from just the experiences you have. Uh, but in hindsight, Ashok, because you know your uh, uh, there was a there was a point at the, at the in the life of the foundation where things came to a real crisis. If you had to go back and uh, you know set up the foundation again, anything that you would have maybe done done differently uh, that. Uh, you know, it's all all's good, all's well that ends well. But you know, if you had to rethink, do you think uh, you would have uh, well, gone through the same journey? Would you have made some changes? Just I, I I don't know how to answer that because I made a lot of mistakes, and the the book is a memoir, so I, you know, when you're it's a reflective book, so I felt I had to put all those mistakes out. Now, normally you say I'll never make those mistakes again. I actually, the, here's, the, here's the problem perhaps. I didn't think they were mistakes. I still don't think they were mistakes. And I probably would do it again. And I may not advocate this kind of route to everyone because it's stressful, it's rewarding, it's a lot of stuff. Now, for example, when you do a startup, you, you, you're kind of careful. I went and recruited a whole team of seven people even before we had our first grant. Uh, and so on and so forth. We spent more money than we had to the point to which we were going broke because I simply was possessed of a feeling that this is undeniable. And why is it undeniable? Uh, actually, I don't know. <laughs> I just felt, I just felt, I'll tell you why. I think it was because of the power of women. It was about the power of women who are the core of the problem or the core of the solution. I know that if you work with them and they lead and you follow a bit, magical things are bound to happen. I, I said, this will not be denied. And so I went through a lot of downs and almost we almost died in the process and ups. And I'm not necessarily a spiritual person in the conventional sense, but I think the number of times I've been saved from the brink or got unexpected grace from somewhere. Somebody up there was taking pity on me and saving me time and again uh, from all of this. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. It's not a satisfactory question. I'm not trying to say I'll make the same mistakes again. But it's an attitude uh, which, which comes there. Now, one big difference, uh, Anu, when I did the Avan program, I had endless money because the Gates Foundation was behind me. Here, I was going around with my hat in my hand right uh, asking for money that was one of the mistakes i made i assumed this would be easy so by the way i wanted to say this we talk about restlessness i'm guessing i know ILS is to that extent that the people who come for the program are also thinking in some way at least some of them might be but is there something else that they can do with all the skills i'm just guessing yeah that, 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 that. No, absolutely, Ashok. In fact, I have those conversations several times a week. And of course, everyone is telling me their story as their story. But the underlying thing is that there is something that's not sitting well in their hearts. And they don't know how to... See, the thing is, they don't know how to get involved. There is, a, there is also such a silo in, in so many ways you don't know enough of the social you know social sector what how to contribute but i have those conversations and you know some often i'm smiling by now because it's almost the same script i hear and you know these are people who really want to uh, make a difference build a legacy and so uh, I, I want to i just pull this out i'm just reading from the fly leaf i'm not reading a passage that the story that I believe is this 
and I've written this is the first time, there is an adventure inside every person waiting to be had. It, the discovery of a self long buried within, if that makes sense. It makes absolute sense, uh, Ashok. And I always tell people when they, when they, when they tell me that they want to come into the social sector, I say you're crossing over to the brighter side. Uh, because I really feel like uh, you've got to be an optimist. Uh, I'm an optimist because of all the heroes I read about, uh, you know, through your book, all the Asha workers, all the work, all the work your team, by the way, I must tell you, I was smiling with a lot of them of YF, a few of them of YF, so I recognize Damini in your book. And, you know, I remember her joining uh, the foundation and uh, so many other names that came up of members of your team. Uh, tell us a little bit about Ashok, about working with the government. Uh, you know that uh, there is, the government plays a really important role uh, in providing scale and sustainability. How can a, a government partnership, you know, how do you approach that, um, you know, as a way of building sustainability and scalability for your organization? Well, the first thing we must realize is that working with government is not a choice. Shall I work with them, not work? If you say that you're going to work at scale and you want sustainability, I can't think of any other way but to work with government, right? That's the, the first thing to start with. It's not easy to work with government because government's a very complex machinery. So we, we, we can think of it as a monolithic thing, but you have to learn to find the way through that and find the good officers who will go out of their way who are filled with idealism and so on. But it's not obvious who they are. You have to know the system. You have to know the political system also that goes hand in glove with, with government. But it's not easy. And the reason I'm saying is it's so surprising how many people want to work in the social sector and say, but I don't want to deal with government. There's so many donors who want to give money, but I don't want to deal with government. Because it is the toughest thing to do, and it's, but it's the only thing to do, and it's painful. At the at some of the worst of times, it's painful uh, to do, but that's how it is. So, Ashok, one last question before I hand it over to the audience, and this is there in the book as well, but I'm going to still ask you, what is your dream? You know, you have talked in the book, there's a there's a para on on your headlines five years from now. And I love that. But, you know, what is your dream for the foundation? What is the headline you'd like to see five years from now? I think it's a line we often use, but this is a simply the way of thinking of it we have, which is that every woman, and each child that is born or a woman who lives should have an equal start to a healthy life. It can't be that one womb is better off than the other womb. If we do that, if we can assure that, and some states in India are doing that, India is going to be a very great country uh, as a result because the power of women will be unleashed. Uh, and that too is part of this thing. I don't think that that's a solution you will necessarily see in my lifetime. Uh, but it, you can see a progression there that's very important. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I was, uh, you know, India, I mean, the population of Indian women is some 600 million, which if it were a nation would be the third largest nation in the world, probably almost twice the population of the United States, or certainly one and a half times. Yeah, yeah. And and that, there's so much power in that, but they, but the position of women in India and in so many indicators is, compares with really the bottom of the of the of the pyramid uh, i'm going to uh, ashok just one last question on fundraising your journey through fundraising uh, it, there was challenges at at first have you seen that evolve in the last you know in the last decade are you seeing shifts uh, uh, are you seeing more understanding sort of more strategic philanthropy I think I definitely see a shift happening. But if you're working in this kind of space, it's never fast enough. You, you see movements happening. It's not a wave yet. 
to see good movements happening. If you also work and you understand the international philanthropy, I think India is still evolving. So, for example, uh, the notion of prevention as opposed to treatment, that's not yet well appreciated. So there's a in, in compelling logic to prevention, right? Um, and so on. There are a few other things uh, about this. The notion that you can borrow from business to solve problems at the bottom of the pyramid is not understood by business itself, leave alone philanthropy. Uh, so there is a movement happening for sure in the right direction. CSR is a big deal, by the way. I will point that out. It's a huge, huge wave that's happening already in India. But a wave of positive, I mean, positive is great in terms of the amount of capital it's bringing into the sector, but in terms of understanding, do you feel like there is a lot more that we could, you know, educate uh, CSR yeah. with? We have just received a grant from one of the very uh, good foundations in India. And the person who came from there, the senior person to the field, had no idea. She said, this is the first time I'm entering a village. But at the end of two days, she was completely, completely uh, seized of the whole thing. Now, all it takes, I think, is for a donor or a person interested who's ongoing through restlessness. You, know, you have to visit the field. You cannot, I can't convey in this session what I what I mean. You have to go out there. Even 48 hours is enough when you when you do that. So that would be my my advice. I mean, my field is maternal and child it could apply to any other grassroots social sector work. Right. So yeah. I'm taking this opportunity to invite myself and my uh, alumni. <laughs> to Jhalabar or any of the other places that you, where you, you can you are, host us. You are most welcome, particularly you, Anu, because you are always welcome. Uh, and we enjoy each other's company. We are always welcome. I don't know who all are here, but I'm sure we are actually quite happy for anyone to come if you can schedule it properly. Because I like to think, I mean, at least you go away with a message yourself. And who knows what that may lead to, because you are all very influential people who are in this here in this group today, right? No, absolutely. I'm going to hand over to Evian because there are a few questions. And uh, Evian, over to you. Hi, 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 Anu. Thank you, uh, Ashok. Thanks very much for joining us this evening. Uh, I wanted to quickly also throw in my two cents because I had the chance to read the book. And uh, I wanted to say what struck me quite a bit was the level of clarity you had, you know, just while setting up uh, Antra, because you went through a lot of rejections earlier, and then somehow you weren't willing to budge on the original vision you had, which really kind of struck me quite uh, profoundly. Um, without much ado, let me quickly I, move on to one of the questions. I just want to say one thing, Ashok. I did find myself feeling so frustrated in parts of the book because I was like, there is this track record. There is, you know, some seminal work that's been done. There is, you know, this is this is so important because while you're fo focusing on foundational literacy and numeracy, what happens if you don't take care of the, you know, the child at birth or even in the mother's womb. I mean, what is her, their cognitive ability is going to be? So why are we, like you said, preventive? And why is he still having to struggle so much? It was like, when will we shift the, you know, I felt frustrated, I'll be honest. I was like, why isn't this, why is this such a no brainer? Why aren't people sort of, why does he have to struggle so much to do so much good. So I, I just have to say that. But sorry, Aviana, I have to say that. So jump in. Just no, 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 thank take you. the questions. Yeah, so let me quickly start off. Um, in a sector where there is often a sense of urgency to address immediate challenges, how can organizations strike a balance between responding to immediate needs and investing in long-term capacity building? Now, are you asking me to answer this from a business point of view, or from? No, I think I think just from the point of view of somebody who is, 
who's at the helm of a foundation and can decide what they can address at what point of time and in what time frame? I think that, uh, that well, it's a kind of an abstract question right now, so I, I can only uh, think of that in very specific examples. See, the one thing you have to avoid is this uh, messiah complex where you think that you can be all things to every person because either you're so smart or the problems are so simple. So you're right, then you have to be able to be very clear about what you and your organization is capable of doing uh, rather than and it's called mission creep that sets in otherwise. We'll do this. Okay, working with material and child health, you'll also do sanitation. I mean, you cannot make those assumptions. You have to know what you're good at. What your donor wants you to do. I mean, this is the real world and so on. Oh, you see, sometimes we come across these horrendous situations where you come across a, a woman, like the woman in the first scene, uh, or a child uh, who is suffering and you want to help that child but you also realize that if you solve problems one by one by one you're not in public health anymore you're in doing good uh, in one individual at a time and it's a thing that you cannot I realize one thing you people someone told me once you're in public health you can't get involved with every case I feel that you have to get involved or you can make sure the government system comes in to do that. But that's a very tough choice. I mean, very, very tough choice to make. Um, it's a different kind of trade-off that you're making here. Okay. Um, the next question, how do you see the future of the social sector as it stands currently? How do you see it growing and evolving in the coming five to 10 years with somebody from two decades of experience in the sector? Well, I mean, there, there are two points. First, the social sector is a very broad term to make. I mean, so you can say, uh, how do you see education developing, or how do you see maternal and child health, or whatever, any number of things. So it's difficult to. So I would rather confine myself to the sector that I know well. So I can't pretend that I can make a universal answer, and there is no universal answer here. I think that I'm very optimistic about the way the health of our mothers and children will evolve and get better and better. Because we have within our own country, at least two states, three, uh, that have shown us the way. There's Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Himachal. I don't know whether people know that Himachal Pradesh has some of the best outcomes. In uh, So there are models that they are using and so on. But every single one of them, I dare say, is based on the power of women. I can't drive this home more strongly. It's the biggest solution and is always overlooked. It's always the poor women. But I see a growing strength of women. If you look at it in the rural areas, all it requires is a catalyst. It requires that you get involved in a way that is respectful and you're working as equals. Then there are things that can happen that make the program go viral. I want to go like this because after the point, programs become viral. You don't run a program. You don't fund a program. I see enough of that. And I know from my own experience that it is only waiting to happen. It's already happening. I'm very optimistic in this sense. I don't know that you have to be an optimist to do this from the world as well. Uh, so. Okay. Um, the next question, you talked about how long things could take, be it in getting things done, things executed or seeing results. How did you inculcate the patients needed to carry on? Or is that a personality trait one has to already have? No, uh, people who know me know that I have no patience. <laughs> I, have, I have a very short attention span. Uh, so I have no patience uh whatsoever and i think there are two things you're working in a team there are other people who protect me from harming myself and harming the program also because of that uh so i didn't inculcate any patients i i probably have less patients than i had earlier because there are all kinds of people i'm tempted to use the word sometimes there are all kinds of idiots who get who just 
uh, the, they are the wrong people in the right place at every point of time. And what can you do? Uh, I really don't know. I mean, you have to develop certain tricks like finding where, and this is what the book is called, how the light gets in, how, where, how mm -hmm. the light can get in from here or there. And you have to go to weave your way through. I've learned how to do that a little bit. I've not learned how to deal with the people who are the, the blockers. Somewhere in the book, I've said there are three types of people. There are the blockers, and the, there are the sleepers, and then there are the guardian angels. The blockers will block you. The sleepers won't do anything. And the guardian angels will, will take, you, take you through. So you have to figure out how to navigate that. So yes and no. Uh, I don't have patience. Worse than that, my teammates tell me, you know, show, some people don't have patience, but they never let it show. He, he said, show it on your face all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, you know, I was I'm diverging with my colleague, our CEO, and I were together interviewing somebody for the CEO of our other organization. And that person was dreadful, and really. But, you know, you can't just end an interview after five, 10 minutes. I was looking at her face and she has some people that mm -hmm, smiling. And I'm looking at her face and say, when I grow up, I want to be like her, you know. And then I'm looking at my own face and I look at the face and I said, oh my God, look at this guy. And I realize it's me. I, it's just showing right on my face. So I turned off the video for a while and composed myself. Uh, this is not the recipe for success. Put no. it Okay, no, thank you for sharing that, Ashok. Uh, the next question is from Ritika. She actually uh, graduated from our 17th edition in August. Um, she says, thank you for sharing your insights, Ashok. Under five mortality in India is a truly painful and shocking metric. Have you seen the needle move on this complex issue? How seriously increasingly unfriendly climate impact uh, impact this? Oh. The link to climate change is that what the last part of the question is? Well, exactly. I can't. I don't know about climate change, but I got to say there are more, much more immediate reasons why uh, you know change is difficult. But if you take under five mortality, if you break it down, see seventy percent of under four five mortality happens in one year in the first year. It's infant mortality. Roughly seventy percent happens in the first six weeks, which is neonatal mortality. And most of that happens in the first 10 days and much of that in the first 48 hours. You have to see the telescoping of this, this issue. You will definitely go to the first year, the infant stage. That's 70% of the problem there itself. That's also when the cognitive development of the, the child uh, happens. So it's a crucial first two year period. Now, of course, if you look at the, the graphs, India has made a lot of progress in under five mortality, infant mortality, neonatal mortality. But you have to see where the gap is from that improvement to where we are going to meet the SDGs, the, which the world goes by, the sustainable development goals. I think that we, the, the line has to got to go up even further, more steeply before we can do that. Uh, our neighboring countries, much smaller, less developed. Many of them have far better track records. There's a lot of work to be done here. Um, I don't know the connection of climate change, but uh, I'm, I'm sure climate change is a terrible, you know, has a, has a terrible lot of repercussions, but it cannot be the explanatory variable. The, 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 see, the solutions are very simple. There's something, I mean, what could be simpler than exclusive breastfeeding? I mean, what is the simplest view if a baby is born and all she gets is breast milk for six months, guaranteed you're going to have a healthy baby, right? So you have to ask, like that sector that said, what gets in the way of exclusive breast feeding? And that sets off a whole scheme of. I don't know whether I've answered your question, maybe I'm back. That's how I think of it. No, I think definitely to some extent it's been answered. Maybe not with climate, but. The Antara Foundation collaborates with various stakeholders. How do partnerships contribute to effective capacity building and what role can collaboration play in scaling impact? Well, collaboration is extremely important. Right now we have a partnership with AFQ. 
some people in the audience might know about it. Just they're a remarkable organization who first demonstrate to an RCT that groups of village women without any outside facilitation, they reduce neonatal mortality by a significant margin in, in less than three years. So we have a partnership with them going. Because there's a technology to do all of this. And we don't know it. They know it. We know some other things they don't know. So you have a, a perfect uh, partnership going there. But it's not as though there are abundant partnerships to work with. Uh, for example, when we worked in Rajasthan, unlike Bihar and UP, there are literally hundreds of NGOs you can work with and find a partnership. I think there, and to some extent in Madhya Pradesh, you're not finding enough people you can partner with. They don't find the right partner. Um, and that is something many NGOs shy away from getting dirt under their fingernails. So that is one of the uh, challenges we face. And frankly, not everybody wants to partner with us either. I'm not assuming that we're so great or anything of that kind. Uh, okay. Um... <clears throat> Could you share the major milestones, incidents, or a group of incidents from your journey that cemented your commitment to the sector and the cause? Well, I can uh, only see these as uh, photographs, right? Uh, that first scene of, of suffering of the child within the mother's uh, to see that child healthy, uh, to know that child was healthy when she was on the brink of death was a very, very formative thing. In the book, I would describe a chapter which could be made into a Netflix movie, except nobody would believe these things happen, of a, of a frontline worker who's worked for 37 years in her one particular job of being an Anganwadi worker. And to see the transformation she's affected is absolutely... Uh, absolutely moving and transformational. Uh, I can go after stories, but they're usually stories about individuals that you see. And I could tell the story of a, a nurse, a nurse midwife in the government system, a single person who's going to a remote village, trekking half the way, pregnant seven or eight months, just doing her, her daily job to save lives. And these are very I can tell stories of headmasters who are doing that, adolescent girls who are giving off their time. But over and over and over, by and large, these are stories of women. Right? Actually, it's very interesting. I, I mentioned this. I was at the Bangalore Lit Fest, and I just came back. I'm just digressing a little bit. This importance of, of being a woman, even if you're a man, you know what I'm saying? You have to, you have to be in a woman's head. And I, I felt very insulted because there were four women on the dais and me. So one of them said, ha ha, we got a man with us, so but for sure, we bring you along. So I got kind of pissed off. I said, you know, in this entire room, there's no one who's more of a feminist than, than I am. Uh, and these are tags like feminist and so on, but they only grow by working closely with women and uh, knowing how powerful they are. If you get 12 women together, and I mean, that's a precise number I've arrived at, 12 to 15, not more, not less. And pose any very difficult problem, they will probably come up with a solution if it's a community problem. You get 12 men together, well, can I, can you leave it? <laughs> What's going to happen there, right? Nothing of the kind. There'll be chaos. There'll be ego clashes happening. There'll be uh, all kinds of things from putting it. Uh, so I think this, this is uh, the is the. Uh, Absolutely. What advice would you give to organizations looking to embark on or enhance their capacity building journey? Are there any common pitfalls they should be mindful of? What do you mean by capacity building journey? I didn't understand that. So I think in this context, it means essentially how should they grow to become a bit more efficient or grow sustainably? You know, a lot of organizations grow and then grow too fast. Now you're posing that as a as a business question, right? Or but I take it you're asking me. Uh, I could try to answer. I still remember my my McKinsey training to try to answer that. 
But I think you're, you are, that's not, there are much smarter people than that in the room today. But I take it you're perhaps asking what, how does an organization build its capacity to work with the social sector and still not lose its business mission? I'm interpreting this uh, a bit. Now, this is not easy because I believe a business, uh, says business should be business, right? I mean, you have an obligation to your shareholder and so on. So it's a way of finding a cause that an organization can embrace which is congruent to its core business. Or it is something that gives their own employees a charge to go and work in that sector and come back. And there's actually a great transference between the other way that if you're working in the, in the very front line, you're taking away business lessons from there. I can't explain it better than that. We don't have time. Uh, organizations should, could explore it that way. But you need somebody near the top who's also feeling a restlessness to say, my business is not mm -hmm. just about next quarter's problems. There's something more to it that can, that can happen. Okay. Um, we're almost running out of time for this. I'm going to ask one last question that's come in. Are uh, universities and colleges valuable partners for social sector organizations? either for research or volunteers to create more awareness early on? Yeah, I think universities and colleges are, are very important. Um, for example, now, you know, I didn't mention this, that I have enough of my business training to know that data is the most important thing. And I think you can talk about women and all that stuff, but let's not forget data is a backbone on which the business is run and we run, right? Mm -mm -mm mountains of data. We have data on tens of thousands of women and children and so on and so forth. How do you analyze this data? Can you use artificial intelligence here? Or can you have machine learning going on here? We're actually starting a discussion with one of the IITs who are much better than we can ever be at something like this. There's a university. At another level, uh, universities, the number of people we are now recruiting from Ashoka, which Anu knows very, very well. We only had one person from Ashoka, I think in the last season, I think we recruited 23 people. Now they're bringing a very different uh, thinking. It's a liberal arts thing. They're bringing a very different thinking. And I, I think they are, so many people coming from liberal arts backgrounds are adding incredible value. By the way, I didn't forgot to mention this. People are starting in our program of age of 22, 24, 25. The average age of the organization is 29, 30. If you take me out of the organization, it'll, it'll probably be 26, 27 or something like that. <laughs> that, is the, <laughs> that is the very young. Two-thirds women, by the way. So. Um, Anu, before I pass it back to you, one last question. I show you can answer it in one line. It's from Rana. Again, he's an alumni of us. What advice will you give to leaders from the corporate world who are trying to transition to the social sector? I would advise them one thing. Go out into the field and spend, if you can, spend a week there. Right? I'm making an offer here, which is maybe a... But if there are people who are seriously interested, then get in touch with me. Because I feel that that's the only way in which you can talk all you want. I can talk all I want on this program. But you spend 48 hours in the field, you'll see something else. That's my best advice I can give. Thank you, Ashok. Anu, I'll give it back to you for the last Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Abhyan. Thank you so much, Ashok. Uh, Ashok is the most unlikeliest of uh, social sector leaders, if whatever the word that is. He's impatient. You, he 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 calls a spade a spade. <laughs> He's you can tell from his face if he thinks you're a fool. All that, all that is on one side. On the other side, what shines through, and especially through the book, but even otherwise, I've known him a long time. It's just this deep, deep belief in the power of women and the deep belief uh, and commitment to the cause. I mean, it's. Uh, I, I would recommend once again, everyone read the book. I have it here because we've read it so much that we've lost the talk cover, uh, but uh, do read it. Thank you so much, Ashok. You are an inspiration to all of us. I am going to take you up on the 
uh, offer of coming and visiting. I want to meet some of the people I've read so much about. Some of yeah, them. My, my my only my only regret in this whole thing is that I couldn't see the audience. I would be have been very interested to see them. I, yes, I know this is the format. That's the challenge with this kind of format that we we can't have it open. And you know, I would have liked them to just unmute and talk to you. But I think in a webinar format, unfortunately, that's not allowed, or it doesn't work that way. But we'll rectify that. We you know we'll have you over uh, soon enough for another event. But thank you so much, Ashok. Really, thank you. And uh, uh, back to you, Evian. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Again, thank you, Ashok. And uh, just wanted to quickly talk about the leadership program. We are hosting our 19th edition of the program uh, this coming January. It's starting on the 26th. It'll end on February 3rd. It's a nine-day residential program. It'll take place in Delhi NCR. Um, we're open for applications, and we'll be accepting them till the 7th of January, 2024. So if you're interested, now is the time to apply. Holiday season is coming, so the quicker the better. Um, and of course, if there are any other questions and uh, things you want to reach out to us for, there's an email ID at the bottom, uh, copy paste it. You'll also be receiving an email from us tomorrow, so you can always respond to us over there. But thank you very much. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you very much.